Oh, Marty, I guess welcome home because you're just back from seven weeks, was it, in, yeah, in Ethiopia? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It, it must be an element of culture shock, though, for guys who come from here. I mean, you're relatively used to it. You've been several yeah. times. But for people who, who come to Ethiopia for the first time, they hit Addis Ababa. What, what sort of reactions do, do you get from, from team members? Yeah, look, I think that is a big one. A, a lot of it's also to do in the preparation. So there's quite a bit of preparation before they go. So they have a form of expectation when they go. My job is to make sure the expectation is not too high. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when they do go, they actually end up like really enjoying it, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, but the, there is a culture shock because I think people have a perception of Ethiopia that everyone's starving, all the kids got flies on their face and it's in a dreadful condition. That is only parts of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a very vast country, it's a very beautiful country. It's a very beautiful culture with incredibly beautiful people. So. But in saying that, there's still a level of poverty that we do not experience here. So everybody's reaction is different. But that's part of my enjoyment of it because I like to take people out of their comfort zones and put them in another place where they can be challenged on a personal level. So where they get to see some of the, the cultural side of the country, some of the geographical beautiful sites, some of the historical sites, etc., etc. It's an amazing country. But as well as that, there are other Kiwis who have done far more work in Ethiopia that I mean, stuff that I, I dream of doing, you know what I mean? One of those is the Fistula Hospital, and of course that was set up by Dr. Reginald Hamlin, who was a Kiwi, and he had, has an Australian wife, Dr. Catherine Hamlin. Uh, Reg has, uh, died, uh, died a while ago, um, and Catherine is continuing the work over in, in Ethiopia. So we visit the Addis Ababa Fistula Hospital for the main purpose to show the team members what you can do in one lifetime. And I tell you, if you ever get the chance to go to see that place, it is amazing. It makes me cry every time I go there. The impact of God's grace is just phenomenal. I mean, they started from nothing, and you should see the place. It's unbelievable, and they are bringing surgical healing to thousands of women. It's just such a fantastic story of God's grace through one willing couple. Unbelievable. And we've spoken to Catherine on the program, and, and she's a legend. Uh, just, just yeah, legendary is, is, really. is the word. Yeah. But you're also looking at, at, at free trade, uh, fair trade, fair trade, as, yeah, as yeah, a, sure. Um, a, which again is, is a, I suppose, another offshoot from the same, the same thought. Yes, it is. Whenever I take teams, we visit the. Orimu Coffee Farmers Cooperative Union, which is the organisation that exists in Ethiopia which sells the fair trade coffee. It also sells other coffees, but it deals also in the fair trade coffee. Now, for, for the viewers who don't understand, there's a 2,000% markup from the coffee bean to your coffee cup if you buy one at a cafe. Now, that's ridiculous. What's ridiculous about that, or what's actually very unjust about that, is the coffee farmer gets the raw deal. Now, what fair trade does is it it sells its coffee for a premium, and that premium goes back to the coffee farmer through the cooperative unions at local level, and then they decide how they're going to distribute that premium to their local community, whether it's building a school, a medical centre, etc., etc. We believe, however, there's more that can be done. So I'm fascinated in the coffee industry because Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee. It has the world's best coffees. You get if they harder, and there's some harder coffee here on the table, and. But its farmers live in extreme poverty and are some of the poorest of the world. And some of those farmers are turning to other uh, products like CHAT, which is a local drug, um, and they're growing that instead and they're ripping out their coffee. And, and this is coffee that's been passed down from generations. So, yeah, I'm really interested to expose more in the industry, to learn more about it, and through a good friend of mine, Scott Pebbler, who works for Cerberus Greg here in, in New Zealand. Um, He's educated me a lot about coffee, and we're very interested to finding out more of what we can do to make life better for those who are in extreme poverty. That is the coffee farmers. But in fact, even the, the covering on the, uh, on the table there, there's a story behind that too, isn't there? There's another Kiwi that's working in Ethiopia. Uh, her name is Amanda Blewett, and she's set up an NGO called Design for Dignity. Now, what she does is that she works with marginalised communities to produce goods that can be sold on the local market and elsewhere. And she works with the leprosy community up in a place called Dese in the, in the north of, uh, of Ethiopia. And they make garbies such as these. And these are ladies with leprosy. They will spin the cotton. They'll do it from woe to go, you know what I mean? And then she helps them put a little business plan together and helps sell and produce these garbies. And so we support her work by visiting her, by informing my team members of what she's doing. And 
again, to me, she's a legend as well. She's only she's a young thing in the early 30s, and she is sacrificing what I think are the best years of her life to serve the people because God's touched her heart and has spoken to her about how she can help those in extreme poverty. And I mean, people like that to me have my total respect. It's stunningly beautiful colours. Oh, as well. it's, just, it's just fabulous. Yeah, yeah. And they wear Great. that like as a, as a shawl, you know, because yeah. it, it, it can be very cold at night. So yeah. you'll often see, and you might see in some of this footage of, of people wearing these type of shawls in public. Yeah. 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 And an orphanage as well. You've been, oh, you've been, had a very busy seven weeks one way or another. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you've been visiting an orphan an orphanage that, that's also run by Kiwi. Yeah, um, well, it's not run by Kiwi, but it has a very strong Kiwi yeah. connection. It's, it's called Hannah's Orphanage. And one of the ladies in the Ethiopian community here is a very good friend of Hannah. And Hannah said, up this orphanage in 1994 by uh, taking in a couple of children that, whose parents had died of AIDS, which is quite common over there. And she has a heart from God to serve the, her people, particularly the orphans. And so that's what she does. She now has over 200 children in her care. She has these children spread in different homes in Addis Ababa and outside of Addis Ababa now. And so we support her financially. We support her by visiting her work. We take over uh, clothing from New Zealand every time we go. I take the team to visit the orphanage, hoping that some of them will be touched by the experience and moved to help give. And what we're doing here in Auckland is that we've set up a charitable trust called Hannah's Orphans Trust. And that trust is set up purposely that people can give with confidence knowing that 100% of the funds goes directly to Hannah's Orphanage. Because I'm trying to cut through the cynicism Unfortunately, that's taken root in people who say, well, why should I give because the money's not going to get there? So we feel very strongly about that, and so we've set up that, um, that trust specifically for that purpose. So that really is a highlight of the trip because these children are just absolutely beautiful. Mm. <laughs> and you'll see it on some of the footage. They're, yeah. they're just beautiful children. Because One of the other remarkable things is that, I mean, you've, you've mentioned, you've mentioned the, uh, some of the people who've, who've helped you, but getting stuff out there, You've had people say, "Oh, look, we'll we'll give you three hundred kilos of yeah, of, exactly of space." I mean, that, how do you do that? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I have a fundal, fu fundamental belief that if God calls you to do something, that's what you've got to do, and God opens the doors. It's not my responsibility. The scripture says that God will open the doors. He can open the door that no man can open. The reality is, if it's of God, God opens the doors. So I spoke at a Rotary Club once, uh, Western Springs Rotary, and there happened to be somebody there who works for Menzies. He happens to be in charge of the transport. They are the transport carrier for Emirates, and we use Emirates. And Emirates also sponsor our flights. They They've given us reductions on our flight costs so I can get more people over there. Menzies said, we will give you X amount of kilos every time you go so you can take specifically gear for the orphanage. Now, that's fantastic. We can't really necessarily afford to take extra kilos because it is very expensive to take extra kilos on a flight. So for them to do that is incredibly generous. And, but because of what they've done, the orphanage now has a lot more clothing, etc., etc., and we're able to do that every time, and, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. And to be honest, it's nothing to do with me. God just opened that door, so we just walked through it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic story, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Not a problem. Cheers. Great.